In this lecture, we will discuss the pathophysiology of heart failure, including two processes, systolic and diastolic dysfunction, the causes of both processes, the clinical signs and symptoms of heart failure, and compensatory mechanisms that the body uses to adapt to heart failure. Heart failure is a clinical syndrome and a diagnosis made clinically based on a set of signs and symptoms of fluid overload and a reduced cardiac output. There are two processes of heart failure that you should be aware of. There's systolic dysfunction, which is referred to as heart failure with reduced ejection fraction or HEF-REF. And then there's diastolic dysfunction, which is also referred to as diastolic heart failure. And this is referred to as heart failure with preserved ejection uh, fraction, okay, or HEF-PEF. Now, systolic heart failure results in less blood being pumped out of the left ventricle due to a weakened heart muscle okay and as we can see here so again this is systolic heart failure and in systolic heart failure or dysfunction which is also referred to as heart failure with reduced ejection fraction you have a weakened heart muscle okay going on here and as a result of that weakened heart muscle you can see that it looks dilated you have less blood that's being pumped out of that the left ventricle to the rest of the body. So less blood being pumped out is what we see in the systolic dysfunction, okay? Because there's less blood pumped out, that's why we have this reduced ejection fraction, okay? Now, systolic dysfunction may be a result of hypertension, coronary artery disease, or CAD, a myocarditis, valvular disease, or from an infiltrative process. Now, in contrast to systolic dysfunction, we have diastolic dysfunction, or HEF-PEF, okay? And this maintains a preserved ejection fraction, but less blood flows uh, fills the left ventricle due to the stiffened myocardium. So if you look here, so now we're talking about this diastolic dysfunction, okay, or hef PEF with the P meaning preserved. So remember this R is reduced ejection fraction and this is that preserved ejection fraction, meaning that if you get an echo, their uh, left ventricular ejection fraction will be normal, okay? Uh, these with diastolic dysfunction. And here you have a stiffened heart muscle. So notice that it looks thickened here, hypertrophied. So a stiff left uh, ventricle there. And as a result, it's so stiff and enlarged, the cavity almost looks smaller and you have less blood that's able to fill that ventricle, okay? And that's what we tend to see in diastolic dysfunction or diastolic heart failure. Now, diastolic dysfunction may also be a result of hypertension and coronary artery disease, as we saw with systolic dysfunction. Other common causes include just normal aging, so as you get older, obesity and diabetes, all right? Now, most patients with heart failure will have both of these processes, meaning they're both systolic and diastolic dysfunction, or at least somewhat of a combination of the two. The outcome of systolic and diastolic dysfunction is an increase in left ventricular filling pressures, which are transmitted to the lungs and subsequently to the right ventricle and the body. So again, what's happening here is that our left ventricle, okay, in both cases is being affected. And because of that, you have uh, pressure that's transmitted backwards, okay? Backwards pressure going to the lungs, okay, here. So this is blood coming from their lungs, so it's going backwards and eventually coming back to the right side of the heart into the body, okay? So that's what you have an increase in pressure in here that's pushing it backwards. So that's the main concept in these, all right? And it's these increased pressures that cause the classic signs and symptoms of heart failure that include dyspnea or shortness of breath, in which the patient may have a difficulty or labor, labored breathing. They may have orthopnea, which is discomfort when breathing while lying flat or in the supine position. So if someone lies flat, they may not be able to catch their breath, okay? Or they may wake up at night and have paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea or PND. That's one thing to look for. Peripheral edema, you may see, and this is often swelling that is uh, backs up into the lower extremities, and some of these patients may have pitting edema, okay? The backup of pressure can also cause ascites, which is a fluid accumulation in the peritoneal cavity. They may have crackles, which is the clicking, rattling, or crackling noises that you may hear on pulmonary auscultation, and this is due to pulmonary edema or fluid in the alveoli in the lungs, okay? And this often does not clear after coughing. 
you, they may have elevated jugular venous pressure or jugular venous distension. And this is another clinical sign of venous hypertension and often seen with right-sided heart failure, which may be secondary to lung pathology or even severe left-sided heart failure that eventually becomes right-sided heart failure, okay? And this increased back pressure into the superior vena cava causes that jugular vein to bulge, okay? So you can see that SVC here in both of these images coming here. So if you have that backup of pressure into the SVC, you may see bulging of it into in the neck veins, okay? And that's what we mean by this uh, JVD or jugular venous distension. Now an S3 is often heard. You may hear this with systolic dysfunction. And this is an er a sound heard in early diastole and results from a sudden deceleration of blood flow into the left ventricle from the left atrium. Now an S4 sound, uh, may result from a stiffened left ventricle, as we said here. Okay, so we often see this in diastolic heart failure, and this is rarely ever a normal finding. Okay, now a few last points to discuss before ending are some compensatory mechanisms activated to adapt to a reduced cardiac output and increased pressures in heart failure. First, in response to an increase in preload, the heart dilates to improve myocardial contraction. You may recall that Frank Starling curve, okay? That's pretty much what it's working on. Second, in response to an increase in the wall stress from the increased filling pressures and dilation, the cardiomyocytes may hypertrophy, okay? This initially reduces wall stress, but eventually leads to reduced left ventricular compliance. These changes initially attempt to improve or maintain stroke volume. However, over time, it contributes to worsening cardiac function. Okay, so that's pretty much going on. When you have these, this pressure in the left ventricle, things may hypertrophy. Okay, so the heart initially tries to overcompensating by getting bigger, these cardiomyocytes uh, hypertrophy. And as a result, but eventually over time, you may have this diastolic dysfunction where less blood can actually fill or it just gets weaker, and as a result, you get worsening heart function over time. Now, another compensatory mechanism is upregulation of the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, or RAS, okay? Now, we won't go over all the details here of that system, but that's something you can easily search and find, but let's go over the highlights that are important for heart failure. Now, when you upregulate this RAS, this uh, renin-angiotensin-aldosterone uh, system, you get an increase in angiotensin II and aldosterone, okay? So you increase in both of these uh, happen, okay? And angiotensin II stimulates thirst and causes vasoconstriction, and this improves uh, blood flow, okay? So this angiotensin II will stimulate thirst, okay? And it also causes vasoconstriction and both of these will help uh, at least the vasoconstriction will help to get blood you know passed because you're trying to get it to the rest of the body so on the other hand what we have is this aldosterone here this is also increasing when you have upregulation of the RAS system okay and aldosterone increases fluid retention by increasing sodium resorption so if you remember as you absorb sodium the water comes with it and this is what aldosterone is doing now, in addition, you have adrenergic nervous system that is stimulated. So you have this adrenergic nervous system that gets stimulated. And as a result, this releases uh, epinephrine, norepinephrine, and vasopressin, okay? And all of which increase contractility, the heart rate, and vascular resistance. So all three of these that are uh, then, you know, increased by the, the adrenergic nervous system, which gets upregulated, you get an increase in the contractility, okay, to help the heart function better and just get forward flow, okay? You don't want things backing up, so it's trying to contract more. You also get an increase in the heart rate, so the heart rate increases, and then you also get an uh, increase in vascular resistance, okay? So increase in vascular resistance, just saw, as we saw with angiotensin II uh, vasoconstricting. So that again is another mechanism that do, does so. Now vasopressin also causes water retention, okay? So that's one thing, the aldosterone, Okay, water retention by sodium uh, resorption. So you have an increase in water and sodium, and this vasopressin also increases water retention.
okay so again just trying to get more more blood flow uh, to go forward okay and constricting down on these vessels now in all these mechanisms help to initially improve blood pressure and forward flow so you're trying to get more blood in the vessels to increase the pressure and have blood flow going forward however over time the increase in blood pressure causes an increase in afterload okay and this results in a reduce in stroke volume and increased ventricular preload okay so as you can imagine as you're getting more blood that's pretty much coming in okay and you're having constriction of these vessels so imagine your aorta or those distally constricting down you're having an increase in pressure you have to work against so the heart has to work against an increase in pressure and that causes even more of a backup okay so you may have a greater thickening of the heart okay with time you may also have uh reduced stroke volume okay and you can see you have an increased ventricular preload because you just have less uh, blood flowing forward okay so that's pretty much the main things you're seeing over time and the increase in volume also increases the preload as we mentioned and causes left ventricular distension with a consequent increase in pulmonary pressures and enlarged heart size from cardiomyocyte hypertrophy and elongation okay so again things just pretty much getting worse and moving backwards over time additionally the elevation in these neurohormones that we mentioned causes myocyte injury and adversely promotes remodeling okay so over time all of these well helping in the acute setting for the patient okay the body's trying to compensate for this acute heart failure or decompensated heart failure picture but over time these are not good if not controlled okay so it's really important to catch these early now ultimately this results in a cycle of slowly worsening of the left ventricular function with decreased forward flow and increased pulmonary and right-sided pressures okay all of which lead to the heart failure signs and symptoms we discussed earlier of pnd dyspnea orthopnea uh, peripheral edema ascites crackles and so forth okay okay mostly those that are re pretty much represent right-sided heart failure okay now understanding these processes are important because when we discuss potential therapy options uh, these are some of the mechanisms that we try to go after all right let's briefly review what we discussed before we end all right so again heart failure is a clinical syndrome this is diagnosed clinically based on signs and symptoms of fluid overload and decreased cardiac output remember some of the signs and symptoms you'll see on exam or with the patient describing are paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea okay or dys dyspnea, dyspnea or orthopnea the patient lying down having to use more pillows at night because they get out of breath when they're lying flat are some symptoms they may, may be edematous they have may have weight gain okay so it's always good to look at what is their baseline weight and then have they increased over time and that's some of the ways we look at how to treat these people that and manage them with more advanced or chronic heart failure ascites crackles okay an increase in that jugular venous pressure okay as the superior vena cava uh, has backup of pressure and you see distension of the jugular vein and then s3 and s4 remember uh, s4 you may see with that diastolic heart failure um, and oftentimes s3 with the systolic okay s4 is really never normal there's two processes that we discussed systolic dysfunction and this is when you have heart failure with the reduced okay ejection fraction whereas diastolic dysfunction is heart failure with preserved ejection fraction okay so two different processes that we mentioned remember with systolic dysfunction which may be from ischemia hypertension coronary artery disease okay you get a weakened heart muscle and as a result uh, less blood the heart left ventricles heart function weakens and cannot pump blood forward okay with diastolic dysfunction again you can have this with hypertension cad over time aging obesity diabetes all risk factors can stiffen hypertrophy that heart and as a result you may have less blood filling but remember this is preserved ejection fraction okay both remember most patients end up having both of these conditions okay both systolic and diastolic or a combination or one may start and often the other follows okay now we mentioned a number of compensatory mechanism all right with the preload increasing you have dilation of the heart and that with the preload and all that stretching the wall stress you may get hypertrophy of the cardiomyocytes okay as we saw with this here all right so looking at the ekg looking for signs of lvh you may see uh, or a new pattern of that 
You also see an increase in the renin angiotensin aldosterone system upregulation. We have an increase in angiotensin II that causes increase in thirst, in vasoconstriction, aldosterone, increasing water and sodium absorption. And then you remember the adrenergic, the neurohormones, epinephrine, norepinephrine, and vasopressin that increase contractility, heart rate, and increase vascular resistance in the vasopressin, also contributing some water uh, into the vessels, all trying to increase blood pressure but and also increase forward flow but as we mentioned over time these can have de uh, deleterious effects on the heart and on the patient well that's the end of this lecture we discussed the pathophysiology of heart failure including two processes systolic and diastolic dysfunction the causes of both of those processes or at least common causes clinical signs and symptoms that we can see in heart failure and compensatory mechanisms that the body uses to adapt to heart failure i hope you learned something